Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 117 of Humanity versus Insanity, the Crane Report. And this is being broadcast to you from the uh, Plymouth studios of UK Column on Thursday, the 6th of June, 2019. And uh, the topic for tonight is the Common Law Court. And uh, we'll be looking at how the uh, jurisdiction of the Common Law Court applies to, or challenges even, the uh, British legal system, the orthodoxy at least of the British legal system. And one of those speakers who made uh, a very, very significant contribution, um, got a lot of attention, had a tremendous response to his workshops on the Monday afternoon, is uh, John Smith, who is my guest tonight. And uh, John, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, welcome you to tonight's episode of Humanity vs. Insanity. And I just want to make the observation that you said at AV10 that, that was the first time that you had actually presented in that kind of environment to, uh, to that, that uh, scale of audience. Yes, that's correct. I've spoken one or two small venues to a small crowd before, but uh, it was eye-opening. It was very well, interesting and it was something I was glad I, I, I got behind me. Well, you know, you, you, you were outstanding. Your presentation was outstanding. I mean, absolutely outstanding. And um, I mean, I think you could tell from the interest of people uh, approaching you. And of course, this is the unique element of the AV events that uh, the speakers are accessible to the people who attend so they can buttonhole you and uh, sit you down over a meal or over a, over a beer or whatever. And um, and ask, you know, more detailed or more personal questions. Yeah. No, it was excellent. It was great to meet everyone. They seemed to enjoy it. And I said, it wasn't just myself. It was all the rest of the speakers that were there as well. Covered some excellent, uh, some excellent information, which I certainly learned a lot from. And it was very interesting to speak to some of the other presenters as well. Okay. Well, I, I always learn a lot. And, and of course, that's, um, that's part of the criteria for selecting the speakers, because, uh, uh, you know, I want to be educated and stimulated and... Um, uh, you know, I, I, certainly that was absolutely the case. I mean, there wasn't a there wasn't a weak link in the whole event. And I know that you were extremely moved by the presentation of David Noakes. And of course, um, you know, Lynn Tyre came up onto the platform towards the end of David's uh, presentation. Lynn, of course, w was and is, you know, uh, extremely emotional right now. And of course, she's still uh, feels that she is facing the prospect of extradition to France, despite uh, facing no charges uh, in the UK. And um, uh, you've had conversations with David and Lynn, and you've picked up the gauntlet uh, to fight or help Lynn resist this perverse extradition order that has been uh, put in place by Judge Supperstone. Yes. Uh, well, the story itself is moving, and it's something which affects every individual in the country, not here, but worldwide. And I think what's actually happened is, is the way that the state have attacked them is disgusting. Uh, they're actually using a legal fiction to try to prosecute a living woman, and it says they're trying to extradite her abroad, uh, but they're not actually disclosing, or the courts are not disclosing what they're actually doing. And people go into these courts, supposedly courts, they're just administrative hearings, they're places of business, and they certainly are not there for justice. Uh, but they're using the fiction fraudulently to try and attack someone and extradite them. It's disgusting. So now, John, there's yeah. obviously a lot of people watching this who will know precisely what you're talking about when you talk about yeah. legal fiction versus the yeah. uh, living person. Or sorry, I shouldn't say living person, yes. living man. Um, yeah. Uh, but obviously there may well be others who are not. So could you give us a little bit of uh, an explanation on the difference between the fiction, the legal fiction, which um, unfortunately yeah. most people believe is uh, the living man, uh, but the courts know very well isn't. And so give, give us a bit of an explanation as to how this works. Yeah. The state, as is for business purposes, decide to create a legal fiction at Buff. So they inform your parents that they are required to record your buff with a buff certificate entry. In doing so, the state then create a legal fiction, but according to their rules, they're doing so fraudulently. 
because throughout your life, they will only ever deal with this fiction. They don't deal with a living man or woman. They only deal with the legal title, which is the fiction. So therefore, any contracts you have uh, are for the legal fiction. For example, you have a name on your driving license, on your passport, on your bank card. These are all legal fictions. They're not actually addressing you as a living man or woman. They're using the fiction to contract with you. Now, the difficulty about this is when they actually created this fiction, knowing what they were going to do, they have actually failed to inform anyone. Now, according to their rules under contract law, for uh, because it affects more than one individual, it affects the baby, the child, the parents and the government. So therefore, according to the state's rules, it is a contract. Now, again, according to their contract rules or contract law, as they put it, for a contract to be valid, there has to be full disclosure, which simply means all the parties involved must know what's going on. Well, certainly I've never been told what they're doing and my parents were informed, but the government have withheld this information. So therefore, because there's no full disclosure, effectively the contract is void, which means that the use of the fiction by the state, the legal title for men and women, is fraudulent. Now, because it's fraudulent, and we've decided that the common law court, when you actually confirm your, uh, your ID or your, your existence as a living man or woman, you can do so by submitting a declaration to the common law court confirming your existence as a man and woman, but therefore you're allowed to claim ownership of the legal fiction. Now, the only way you can do this is because it was created fraudulently. So the state have no right to this. You cannot cancel it because it exists. It's on your driving license, it's on your passport, on your bank card. But the point is the rightful owner should be the individual that they were trying to attach it to. So therefore, having confirmed your stance under common law as a living man or woman, you then have the right to obtain the fiction. Now, having done that, and I recently confirmed as a fact in law, while attending a court, a statutory court, that I was the owner of my living fiction, uh, sorry, my legal fiction, which is Mr. John Smith. The judge at the hearing and the prosecutor were given the chance and the opportunity to challenge this in court, but both refused to do so. So I confirmed as a fact in law, I was the lawful owner of this fiction and it stood. They had no jurisdiction, no consent, uh, no authority to deal with me. And accordingly, they dropped a criminal charge against me because they couldn't establish this. Now, they didn't challenge this, but they were given the opportunity to do so which confirms they know exactly what the situation is. But this is information they don't give the public. And through this fraud, which is effectively it's criminal coercion, they're actually using this against individuals uh, to target them through their own rules. And that's all they are, they're rules, they're not laws. But they actually they target in individual men and women unlawfully and they're penalising them. In the case with Lynn, they're trying to extradite her but they're using the legal fiction to do so. Yeah. And, it, and of course, this, this legal fiction um, emanates from the uh, Sestui Kavi Act of uh, 1666. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the, the legal profession, um, I mean, it actually uh, does stagger me that um, some of them don't know of this act. But when you say SETI K, they know exactly what you're talking about. Because in their parlance, Sestui Kavi has been shortened to Sedi K. And as soon as you say Sedi K, they know precisely what you're talking about. Um, but if you ask anyone who is a member of the Bar Association, they immediately go into denial. Yeah, well, they would do, <laughs> because they don't want the public to know what's going on. The Set KV Trust effectively says it was it was created, the Act was created because of the problems in 1666. Now at the time, it's far not that I was alive at the time, I said, but there was a great plague. There was also a great fire in London. Uh, now my understanding is during this time, there was many, many people had died, and at the same time the Crown was short of income. 
So they had decided with the bankers they would try to sort out a system whereby they can use legal fictions to make money. But they decided that they would set up this act and the requirement was that the parents or anyone alive had to record their birth and the fact they existed. So from then onwards, they started recording births. But in doing so, the state attached the fiction, which they then used fraudulently. I said, but over the years, they've actually informed this and people believe that it's a legal requirement. Uh, well, it is a legal requirement. It's not lawful. It says to record their birth. It says, and the state will actually penalise people and threaten to penalise people for failing to register a birth. But it's not a lawful requirement. You don't have to. Uh, well, and, of system, course, and of course, the travellers community yeah. um, do not register their births. And this, this is one of the reasons why the establishment comes down so hard or attempts to come down hard on the travellers is because they have no restriction over the travellers no. because they, their births are not registered. Yeah, they don't. They, they take it. says what they're doing is, we've mentioned already, it's criminal coercion. Now, a part of when I was speaking at the AV10 conference, which people don't realise, hundreds of years ago, and I can't remember the exact year, but supposedly slavery was abolished. No. It hasn't. We still have slavery. But to be quite honest, this is the government are quite good at what they're doing because they've actually stated slavery is abolished, but they've disguised it. So what they are doing is they're actually attaching a legal fiction to every living man and woman and they're actually using that for fraudulent purposes. But effectively, it says they're not actually branding you with an iron as you used to do in the old days, but they're actually stating to you in the willing court, they will ask you your name, they'll ask you to identify with a fiction, and if you refuse to do so, they will actually issue a warrant for your arrest for non-appearance. Now, you can actually stand and speak to a judge, literally 10, 15 feet away, and they actually issue warrants for your non-appearance because you will not accept the legal fiction. They cannot deal with a living man, which has been proven in my case and very various other cases. The state, because it's a corporation, it's a business and it's run for profit, they cannot deal with the living men, only fictions. If you but, do not accept the fiction, they have no control or authority over you, which is what we're trying to do in Lynn's case. Well, and of course, um, of course. Uh, uh, many people, again, watching uh, this programme tonight will know that I also challenged the jurisdiction of the civil courts in exactly the same way when one of the uh, fracking companies tried to take me into bankruptcy, uh, supposedly for uh, court costs that had been awarded against me. And, um, uh, you know, for, to keep a long story short, but I resisted the, um, uh, the challenge on the basis that I was the executor of the Sestwi Kivi Trust, the Seti K Trust, in the name of Ian Rowland Crane. So as the executor, uh, any attempt to administer that trust was unlawful. And uh, I actually appointed the registrar as the trustee of that uh, trust. And uh, basically he went into apoplexy. And, and the, you know, the way in which they ultimately dealt with it was very, very creative because what they actually did was they created another legal fiction in the name of Ian Roland Crane, but that legal fiction has nothing at all to do with me. It was created purely for the purpose of balancing the books. And uh, obviously this is not something that everybody can a step up to because it does require an enormous amount of study and work and practice and actually learning to use what we think are English words in a completely different way. Yeah, yeah. It's quite clever having learned about this and watched people over the years and spoken to different people. Um, I go back to a story that I, one of the first things I learned, when you actually look at the English language, and they, basically you have a dictionary. Uh, so you can take the Oxford Dictionary for English. So any word there you can look, it has a meaning and the meanings do not change. They will add occasionally new words um, and there may be a new addition, but it's the existing words you have remain there and the meaning stays the same. Now, if you already have a dictionary, why do you require a legal dictionary? 
it's exactly the same words, but under law, the legal system, the words have a different meaning. So therefore, this is the different meaning they use is the concept of legalese. So the courts, the police, they use a completely different language which people are not aware of. Now, unless you know the tricks and you know the language they use, you're actually going to get sucked into their system, which is where they win, because once they have authority and jurisdiction, they will take, uh, through fraudulent means, you're in their system, which means they can then penalise you and hold you accountable. So the trick is to try and get out of the system and to make sure that they have no authority or jurisdiction over you, which is what we do with the common law court. So, so just, just some examples um, of, to explain what we're talking about here. Um, and I'll, I'll speak from you know, my own experience. Um, so when the registrar asked me my name, my response was not to immediately just offer my, my appellation, but to tell him that um, uh, I have an appellation and my appellation is Ian, and he may refer to me as Ian or Sir. But, uh, you know, it is uh, not to be taken as any granting of jurisdiction. And when he asks for a date of birth, I said, well, I couldn't possibly answer that because it would be purely be hearsay. Um, and, uh, you know, so at each stage, whatever, and of course, the classic is, do you understand? And they will try and use that as the catch all, because the moment that you respond in the positive, you have effectively given them jurisdiction because what you have unwittingly acknowledged is that you stand under them. So of course the response again to the question is do you understand is I comprehend but I do not stand under you. And and so you know this repartee that unfortunately has to go on before the case can proceed and uh, basically either the judge or the registrar in my case um, acknowledges that they do not have the jurisdiction and so what they will tend to do is adjourn it so that, you know, basically they can kick the can down the road and pass the problem on to somebody else or find a solution to effectively close it out so that, uh, you know, there's no further embarrassment. And yeah. I, I mean, there, there, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands of successful challenges to the legal system through using uh, common law, but of course they're never reported. And even in my case, where there was a, a, a sympathetic journalist present through all the hearings, but it was so far, the exchanges between myself and the registrar were so alien to her, were so far beyond the bounds of her perception that she actually couldn't comprehend what had taken place and therefore decided that uh, she couldn't actually write a report on the uh, on what had uh, transpired because she didn't understand it yeah. didn't comprehend it yeah yeah it's exactly what the situation is the the existing court system is set up it's not it, it's not for justice we have no justice here which I learned the hard way when I first started off on this road. Um, you have you have a system here which is literally a business. It's a business, it's a registered company, it's run for profit. Now, they decide what's in their interest and they protect vested interests, big bodies, big companies, big money. It says it's nothing to do with justice for living men and women. The system they use is fraudulent and the judges all know this. Now, the fact is, just now, they are allowing this system to run. They're using it criminally against the people. Now, to do so, these idiots, which I call them, are not being held accountable because they're committing crimes on a daily basis in every court in this country. And not only here, but worldwide. They're doing this all over, attacking people, and they're not being held accountable. What we're actually doing with the common law court. Now, the common law court is, exists because it is the people. And the common law court is the people. It's not involved with the state. It's not connected to the state. It's not run by the state. It is the people. So what the are the origins decide. of the common law court, John? Yeah. Pardon? What what are, what are the origins of the common law court? Because they, my understanding well, is it goes back to at least the 13th century. Oh, go back further than that. He says, we, we go back. You see, you, you've got... 
you've got various documents have been established and the, the statutory systems have set up, or the justice systems have been set up predominantly using certain documents which people know of. You have the uh, Magna Carta in 1215. In Scotland, there was a, the Declaration of Arbroath in 1320, and then the Declaration of Arbroath was used with Magna Carta to set up the Declaration of Independence. Now, these documents are valid documents. They're used, but unfortunately, the state tried to dilute them or now ignore them. In this country, what they actually do is say that the Magna Carta has now been replaced because of statutory legislation, which is incorrect. This is the Magna Carta in 1215 stands to this day and can never be altered. But they're actually telling the public that it has been changed and they will relate the statutory laws which has done so. Now, again, statutory legislation is not law. It's a rule. It's a rule for a corporation company. It's the same as saying um, if you get a court summons to attend a court, their courts, they're not courts. They're places of business. They're administrative hearings. They're not courts. But if you get a summons to attend there, it's exactly the same as a, a big company, a supermarket company, whether it's Tesco's or Asda, sending out a court summons for a parking violation in their car park. If they send out a summons inviting you to attend their premises because they're going to prosecute you for a parking offence, would you go up to Tesco's for a hearing? Well, no, you tell them to sort off. Well, it's exactly the same with the statutory courts. They're exactly the same. They have the same authority. He says they are just a corporation, a place of business. They're not law. He says now the people have the authority in this country. The people obviously have the authority. They make the laws. They decide. Now, based on the principles of causing no harm, no loss, no injury to anyone and ensuring that you remain honourable in your contractual dealings. That is the basic principles. Now, we use the, the, the words says common law because this seems to be in the English speaking countries. Most people uh, acknowledge common law in some shape or form. But the common law court is used is based on natural principles. It's effectively natural law. It's also universal law. It's also law of the land. It could be God's law. Now, it doesn't matter which, which category you put it under. It's basic principles of natural law, God's law, the same. It doesn't matter where you come from, race, religion, this is your beliefs. It doesn't make any difference. This is applicable to everyone. Natural law principles, universal law, you can use this. Uh, it's applicable to everyone. If they confirm their standing as a living man or woman, you can do so and use this. Now, up until now, many of your listeners will have a record of their existence. But within this record, the only way that I can clarify they exist would be with a statutory document. So you would find out where someone lived. You would go to the polling records, the voters' roll, the council tax. You would go through the DVLA, uh, driving licence. You've got passports. You've got bank cards. Uh, national insurance num uh, cards. All these things are statutory legislation. Up until the common law court set up a process, there is nowhere else in the world that actually has an international database available for living men and women. Now, we actually have this just now. As from today, we have 59 countries that have signed up to the common law court. Now, it's not people viewing. It's actually people from 59 countries have recorded their birth. So that's effectively confirmed that they exist as a living man or woman, which entitles them to use common law. Now, while common law and the common law court and the process is applicable to everyone, you can't actually use something if we don't even know you exist. So there's still charge for doing this, but by making a simple declaration of your existence, it then qualifies you to say, look, I am a living man and I can confirm it. Now, we've done that in the statutory courts and we've actually had the judges confirm when we produce this information that they have no personal jurisdiction over a living man or woman. So therefore, you've got strike one, they've no authority. So then it comes to the second issue, which is that of the legal fiction, which it has been created fraudulently. And once you apply for ownership of it, you make an application. 
uh, you're then granted ownership of the fiction. And when you confirm that in court, you've taken away the authority and jurisdiction that they believe that they have. Exactly. It's, 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 it's as de declaring yourself as the yeah. uh, executor of the trust in the name that appears on the legal fiction. So mm. now moving forward, obviously, um, uh, Lynn and uh, David um, have been victims of this fraud. And what's interesting is Ju Judge Nicholas Lorraine Smith, I think, went as far as he dare in acknowledging the, um, the fraud. Uh, when he said that this was not a court of law, he was not presiding, sorry, it was not a court of morality, he was not presiding over the moral issues, he was presiding over a court of law, uh, which by definition meant that he was effectively acting on behalf of the corporatocracy. And, uh, you know, but despite making that observation, of course, he still went ahead and um, uh, carried out the duties for which he's extremely handsomely well paid and I believe is about to get another 70 odd thousand pounds on top for the uh, the role of protecting the uh, the state now yeah. so Lynn uh, uh, David obviously served his sentence or he's in the process of serving the sentence he's out of jail still tagged still under curfew Lynn of course faced no criminal charges whatsoever in the UK um, but the French have sought to extradite her. And, uh, you know, I was witness to the fraud perpetrated by uh, Judge uh, Michael Supperstone, um, who, despite a total lack of evidence uh, and, and didn't even have the cojones to uh, make a ruling in court, um, waited until some six weeks later and then simply wrote to her and said, yep, you're going to be extradited. And, and of course, that had happened literally, I think, 24 hours before Lynn uh, and David came up to um, AV10 at the beginning of May. So now Lynn believes, obviously, as far as the uh, criminal courts are concerned, that she is going to be extradited purely on the basis, um, and I'll make the supposition on the basis of one of Supperstone's comments, that... The French judiciary, you know, th this is a, a case of reciprocity where, you know, the French are asking for someone to be extradited. And yeah, we can't see any good reason. But on the other hand, you know, there are times when we want people extradited from France. And so, you know, in, in the interest of reciprocity, then we will simply rubber stamp it and off she goes. Now, you convened a common law court to challenge this ruling and in that process, you annulled the ruling made by Judge Supperstone. So, John, talk us through the, how the common law court was convened and uh, the process for annulling the, uh, the Supperstone ruling and, and now what is happening in terms of the head-to-head -head between the common law courts and the British legal system. The, the issue of uh, the extradition order that was granted um, was at the request of the French. But what you have to remember just now is when the order has been issued, it's issued against a legal title, a fiction. Effectively, it's not issued against a living woman because they have no authority over a living woman. So they are using fraud to try to attach the fiction to a living woman. Now, they can do that. That's fraudulent in itself. Now, while we occasionally hear stories of certain judges in the statutory courts, as they call them, uh, they put out uh, some comments uh, occasionally saying that they're speaking about courts of morality and various things like that. That, that. While that's good to hear these sort of things in court, as you said just now, it doesn't prevent them from proceeding anyway. And in doing so, they're committing fraud because they're using fraudulently the legal title without full disclosure. So what we actually did, or what I did, having met them at AB10, listened to the story as well, and then decided this is unacceptable, I'd actually spoken to them just now. Now, given the state uh, that Lynn is in just now and the effect it's had on her, it's difficult for her to go in and deal with this matter in court. So I put it to her just now that obviously she shouldn't be dealing with this. And after speaking to her, I actually obtained the power of attorney for her, which would allow me to address this situation. So having obtained the power of attorney for her, 
I then decided to speak to them and say, right, what I'm going to do now is I need I says I need to obtain ownership of the legal title, which had not been claimed. So therefore I obtained ownership of the legal title for Lynn, Linda. Now that being the case, I then decided, based on the decision from Justice Supperstone, that that effectively was fraudulent. So I decided to convene a common law court. Now, the common law court, which we pointed out earlier, is the people. There are requirements for convening a common law hearing, and one of the requirements are that you have to advertise the fact that you're convening a court, which is done through the website on a public notice, and also on the premises where the hearing is to be held. So therefore, you give notice of your intention to convene a court, and then Basically, the, people, the public turn up. It's open to anyone to attend. They can turn up. They're then informed about the procedure, what's going to happen, and then you require court officers and jury members. Now, this is done randomly through random selection. Um, if, hypothetically, you ask for jury members and you have 24 volunteers, well, the juries we only have actually convene with 12. So if you have 24 people volunteering, we explain that we have too many and ask if some of them will decline from proceeding with this or volunteer. If 12 people were just to put their hands down and say, look, we won't bother. If we're left with 12, that's fine, we'll take the 12. If the 24 stayed and said, no, we all want to do it, well, then what we do is draw lots randomly to select 12 jury members. The same applies to court officers, and they're given instruction in relation to their role and what they do. When I actually presented the case, I presented it to the common law court. The common law court is the people. It's not one individual. I was there taking a case to the court. So I put the information to the people, and it was simple. In relation to Linda's situation, they had actually issued an extradition order through the fraudulent use of the name, the title that they wished to attach to her, and they They've done so without full disclosure in the statutory courts, which are not even courts. So they haven't even established proper authority and jurisdiction to deal with it. It's all fraudulent. So based on the information and the documentation we'd had, I put this before a jury to explain the situation. The jury adjourned and took about an hour or so to come up with a decision, but they had decided that they would annul the decision, which I had asked for, they also decided, because of the use of the 1939 Cancer Act, they decided it was unacceptable. So they've actually cancelled that and held it. So that's been struck off as well. And then they actually give an order to remove Justice Supperstone from his position immediately without any financial be benefits. So that was done as well. Now, uh, in relation to that, there was a final order which stated that the assets that were taken from David and Linda should be returned within 14 days as well. So that order was given, and then based on that, was submitted it to the courts. Now, initially, because the, the procedure had been dealt with at an appeal court, at the High Court in London, at the Strand, they initially get the copy of the paperwork in relation to this. So what I've done is I lodged, because I have power of attorney and ownership of the legal fiction, I own, uh, sorry, I submitted the paperwork to the High Court explaining that I was lodging a challenge to their authority and jurisdiction. And I also informed them that the, uh, the extradition order has now been annulled. Now, despite putting it in by email and then having recorded uh, a receipt for recorded delivery the very next day, they have the paperwork, and despite numerous phone calls to them, they will not speak to me. And that went in last Thursday, so we had Thursday, Friday, and then Monday and Tuesday. They wouldn't speak to me at all. So therefore, I decided to move up, because ultimately it will go to the Supreme Court. So I contacted the Supreme Court today and said, look, they're not responding. This is a matter of urgency. They cannot ignore this. It's coming here anyway, so I'm now lodging a challenge to the high the Supreme Court. Now, the email went in this morning with all the documentation, the paperwork, the CPS got it, and the barrister representing the CPS all got copies. Within an hour or so of this going in, the Supreme Court came back. Um, it's a nice gentleman who put a uh, response and said, look, we have your paperwork. Before we can proceed with your appeal, we require additional information. Do you have a 
copy of this paperwork in the order you refer to. Now, that is part of the trickery, because what they've actually done is they've said to me here, before we proceed with your appeal, I wasn't appealing. So I responded to them and said, look, I'm not appealing anything. This has been dealt with by a superior court, which is the common law court. The decision has already been annulled. Uh, all I'm doing is I require a hearing because I'm lodging a challenge to the authority and the jurisdiction of the courts and the Crown because I believe that the CPS will not be happy about this, so I want to challenge the authority and jurisdiction. So that went back uh, email uh, it was only a couple of hours later and then we close for business for the end of the day. So we'll see what they have to say tomorrow. But on this point, uh, given the fact that the High Court failed to respond at all, they don't want to deal with this issue because it affects every member of public. Now, when you also think about the work that was done in relation to a cancer cure, which we can see under common law, because the 1930 Act, uh, 39 Act is has been annulled, doesn't exist, and under common law, as a living man, as I'm speaking to it, is it seems to be a cancer cure. So I'm going to use that terminology, which we can do. But the point is, this information is this should be out there to the public. And again, the fact that they're trying to close this down, not because it doesn't work, it's for business, it's for vested interest, pharmaceutical companies. They should not be allowed to do this. They should not be allowed to target innocent men and women that come up with cancer cures. And if you think about the amount of people that's affected by this, it's disgusting that the state not only allow it, but they actually assist in this process. Now, these judges and anyone involved in this process should be held accountable. They should answer to the people. The people have the authority. Why are they allowed to get away with this? And if I noted your, your comment earlier on, which I did pick up on as well, is that they've just been given a huge pay increase, up to 25% of their salary. Yep. They keep them yep. on a job, and yet it's confirmed here as a fact that in doing their job, they're committing fraud on a daily basis and crimes against the people. So what the people have to understand now, we're not actually, you're not asking anyone to change the system or to, to invent the wheel again. The system works, it's there, it's fine. The problems are the people that are actually managing the system or running it, they're doing it for vested interest to protect themselves and for money. They're not interested in people. And yet, if these people are in that position and behaving like that, which is criminally, they should be removed. Now, up until now, there's been no way to hold these people accountable, but through common law courts, they can be summoned to appear in front of the people. The people have the authority, the people dictate what's acceptable and what's not. And until such time as this has obviously changed, uh, this, is used, this is going to be very difficult change in the system. But this is obviously the stage we're at. So what I'm going to do is contact the Supreme Court tomorrow, find out, see if they get back to me. We're looking for a hearing and the hearing will be ja challenge the authority and jurisdiction of the court. We've also con got, uh, asked them to confirm that no further action will be taken just now uh, against Linda. Now, what you've got to also point out to your listeners as well, technically, at this moment in time, Linda has recorded her birth with the common law court. She exists as a living woman. That is confirmed, and that has already been accepted in the statutory courts. With the production of a common law birth certificate, they have no authority over a living woman. The only other thing way that they can attack her is through the legal fiction. But unfortunately, the legal fiction is not attached to her. I own the legal fiction, it's mine. So therefore, if they're issuing a sentence or a, a, an extradition order against the fiction, it's got nothing to do with Linda. I have the fiction, and unfortunately, they can't get away with what they're doing because it's fraudulent anyway, it's criminal coercion, and not only that, it's based on the presumption that the legal fiction was involved in the production and distribution of this product. However, it's not. I own the fiction. I've never seen the product. I know nothing about it. It's as I've not been involved in it. So they can't deal with that. And again, they do not have the authority or jurisdiction to even rule in this matter because I don't consent to it.
Uh, they've already accepted the fact they've no personal jurisdiction over a living man anyway. So unfortunately, it says it's going to be very difficult for the state to argue this. But what we need people to do just now is to show support, stand with her. Ideally, is to contact the Supreme Court. Right, we have the uh, we have the contact details up on screen here, and uh, uh, this is the modified version of what um, uh, was put up on my uh, YouTube live stream the other day. Um, so, because obviously it's now escalated to the Supreme Court, so here's the uh, here's the request, and and this is obviously your your handiwork to support David mm -hmm. Noakes and Linda Tyre. We are asking people to telephone or email the Supreme Court in London and to ask them when the court hearing will be held for the challenge to their authority and jurisdiction and ask them why they are failing to respond to a lawfully issued challenge. And uh, they should email, they should send their email to registry at supremecourt.uk. Mark, mark the email for the attention of the registrar and uh, make reference to the case number, which is C0 stroke 1839 stroke 2018. And uh, so the more people that can find the time and the inclination to send an email to the Supreme Court, you know, it's time to let the judiciary know that they are not only under scrutiny, but uh, increasingly more and more people are becoming aware of the fraud which they perpetrate on a daily basis throughout the entire country and, uh, and even further afield. So this is a very, very interesting and pertinent challenge. And, and of course, it, uh, it, it's absolutely critical that, uh, you know, David and Lynn are not extradited. And, uh, you know, obviously this is Big Pharma using the statutory pr process to ensure that there is no realistic challenge to their supremacy in terms of orthodoxy of cancer cure, i.e. chemo and radiotherapy, for which, you know, they, they make an enormous amount of, or generate an enormous amount of revenue. Yeah, that, no, it is. Uh, the more and more, I think this, this issue is important because it affects literally everyone in the world. It says everyone will have either a friend, a family member who's affected by cancer at one point in their life or at some stage. Now, uh, the fact that there is a cure available and people can use is disgusting that the state are actually keeping this information away, trying to close this down and more importantly, attacking innocent individuals that's involved with this. Now, not only that, they're doing so through fraud, which we've confirmed, in a fraudulent judicial system, it's, and it's all done to line the pockets of big pharmaceutical, co pharmaceutical companies and obviously enhance the state's position. Now, the courts there, this is, should be used for justice, they're not. It's, it's time the people actually started to think about this, how it affects them. It's not a matter of simply turning around and saying, look, this doesn't affect me. You have issues just now which are pending. One is this issue in relation to cancer. You've got other uh, issues which are also pending. You've got 5G as well, which is a major issue worldwide that affects everyone. People need to stand together. But unfortunately, if you stand and you fight them within their system, the chances are you're not going to win. You have to establish your position as a living man, a living woman, and use the authority that you have. This is sort of the easiest way to deal with it. Yeah, John, absolutely. And you, you know, you are on point here. You've uh, picked up the gauntlet. You've taken the whole issue of common law to another level. And uh, you know, thanks to the situation that David and Lynn find themselves in, then obviously this is an opportunity to literally challenge the jurisdiction and the legality or the lawfulness, shall I say, rather than legality, the lawfulness of the uh, statutory courts. So now, John, um, where can people go to get more information on the work of the Common Law Court and uh, any updates on, um, you know, what the what you're doing and what the Common Law Court process is doing? On the, bearing in mind that what, what you have to remember here is it's unlike the statutory system, the common law court is not a business. Uh, it doesn't have premises, nobody gets paid for any work, we have no funds. 
the common law court exists purely as a process to obtain a lawful remedy. However, the only thing that's available is a website, which is www.commonlawcourt.com. Now, when you go onto that, this has been developed. Further information has been added. Uh, we have a latest news section as well. Uh, people can go on and record their birth uh, free of charge. It doesn't cost anything to record any information there. This is establish your position as a living man and woman, and then the updates will be there. There's a video page and an opportunity for people to submit a two to three minute video should they wish to comment on any issues which they believe are applicable to a legal or lawful system uh, in relation to this, uh, the issue with cancer, or in relation to 5G or anything else, even the behaviour of the state. They can record the video, submit that. This is available for everyone to view free of charge. Uh, to save with the latest news, anything will go up. There is a forum which we've just started as well, but we've got many people using this just now. There will be additional contacts set up on the coming week uh, throughout the UK because of many people involved in this. And as I said earlier on, we're now up to 59 countries with people recording the bus on the site. So it's there, everything's on there. Uh, there will be additional information. There's also the opportunity for people to join in and to assist in this process. But Excellent. Uh, they can do that. There's also a contact on the website as well if they want information. Excellent. John, thank you so much for driving this initiative. Uh, thank you for um, your outstanding presentation at uh, AV10. And um, obviously, you know, keep me posted and uh, I will share, you know, whatever I can through my... Uh, you know, morning bulletins. And, um, you know, I look forward to sitting in on a, a common law court at uh, some future date so that I can observe the process. And uh, certainly, you know, anything that uh, we can do to expose the corruption of the uh, statutory courts and uh, the way in which they are literally manipulating people into abject slavery, then obviously it's, um, it, it's all got to be positive. So, Meanwhile, of course, the primary objective here is to prevent Lynn's extradition. And, uh, you know, this is a subject very, very close to many people's heart. And, uh, you know, if Lynn is extradited and obviously David starts uh, the court process or is scheduled to start the court process next February, then if he's extradited to France, then, I mean, it will be an absolute travesty. And, of course, Big Pharma will have... Uh, uh, protected its revenue. So, John, thanks so much for joining me this evening. And um, I'm sure it's not the it's the first, but I'm sure it won't be the last time that uh, you appear as a guest on Humanity vs Insanity. So, once again, thanks for everything that you're doing on this particular subject. Yeah. Well, again, thanks for having me, and also thank you to the viewers for listening in. Uh, hopefully, so they found it informative. Okay. And uh, well, you know, obviously, it's a tough subject. Like I've said, it's um, so far beyond most people's bounds of perception. It really does take a real effort to get your head around. Um, and, uh, you know, as um, was obviously the case with John and in my case, then there's nothing that helps get your head around it than uh, it actually getting right up close and personal to each and each of us. And uh, just to emphasize the uh, website again, we can get the information and um, register your birth with the Common Law Court is www.commonlawcourt.com.